Hello everyone, and welcome to Jiggy Represents. During this video, I will be addressing something that I think uh, a lot of poker players like small six and mid six ones have problem with, and that is uh, being fully aware of what ends they are representing during at any given point during a poker hand. Because in my mind, what I, I'll try to make you understand, guys, is that there are two really important things when you play a hand of poker that you should be looking at. First one is what you think your opponent have, placing your opponent on specific hand range. And that one is normally like fully understood by anyone with like half a brain playing poker. But the second one is so often overlooked and people don't think just as much about it, but you have to realize that it is just as important is what your opponent thinks you have at any given point during your hand. And you should be able to give yourself from your opponent's point of view uh, just as, as specific aim ranges as you are trying to put your opponent on. Uh, these two things, in my mind, are like 100 times more important than what you actually have, your real end. Because when you totally understand that, when you, you totally understand and you're always fully aware of what you think he has and what he thinks you have, you will discover new plays. You will be thinking just so much better because you won't be stuck with your real cards and you will be able to make stuff like uh, vary your bet sizing to make him make mistakes or turn made hands into a bluff because you don't really care about what you are actually holding and you think you can make fold better hands and stuff like that. Things that a lot of, like like I said, small stakes, mid stakes players don't even think about. So that's pretty much it. We will get started. Uh, I'm going to be looking at four different hands that I think are pretty interesting. Yes. And uh, that's it. Let's go. Let's get to the first hand. Okay. Our first hand here is a hand that I've been played by one of my students uh, during coaching session. And during that hand on the river, he was about to make a mistake because he was not fully aware of what he was trying to represent as a bluff here. He was about to make a mistake on his bet sizing, bluff bet sizing on the river. So we'll get to the river and we'll see what this mistake was about to be. So we find 10 7 suit in the cutoff, which is pretty much the nuts. So we open that to 40 and get called by the small blind, who is Carolus Rex uh, the 12th. Uh, we didn't have much of a read on him at that time. The only read I think that we have is that he looks like a regular, and that is pretty important in that spot. Uh, since he looks like a regular, he's playing uh, many tables, and he's playing something like 23, 20, or something like that. Uh, we have to expect uh, some hand reading from him. Uh, he's not just clicking buttons randomly. He's going to try to put us on hand ranges during the end. So that so representing uh, something will be relevant. Uh, our bets will have some meaning to him, and that's what we want uh, in the kind of spot that we're gonna go, we're, that we're gonna get. So we flop the ten. I flush draw here. Uh, the normal play, the standard play, would be to see bet that, but we ended up checking it back, which is I think a, a great play as well. Because, like I said, standard play, like 90% of the time, people, they flop flush in position, they had the lead in the betting, they're like, all right, I am semi, see my bluffing, whatever. So they see bet that. But uh, mixing your plays a little is, is pretty important, uh, especially against regular, and that is one great spot to do this. I wouldn't check back, like, uh, the A5 flush draw here, because we would miss so much value against like a lower flush draw stuff or stuff like that but here with the 10 i flush draw and no real gut shot or, or stuff like that if we get check raised 100 big blind deep i think like our life is gonna suck because uh, we won't have that many uh, good options uh, we w we won't be looking at a very good spot 
So I think that the knife lodge draw here is a good spot to check it back because actually he's, he's not going to expect us to check back flush around that flop so if the flush comes uh, we will we will be able to extract some value and stuff like that so and we can delay our, our continuation bet anyways if we end up whiffing on the turn so we check back that and the turn is jack of spades now Carolus Rex bets 22 into us what I'm going to do here first is look at what he thinks we have when we check back the flop. Uh, I think most likely holding like when we check back the flop would be tall air that just gave up. Uh, we're not seabetting 100% uh, of our end, so we could have error for sure here. We could have also any medium strength end, and people tend to, and that's correct way to play it, uh, Time to check back their medium string hand for putt control uh, on that kind of flop. Something like ace eight or pocket nine or queen with a bad kicker or stuff like that. Uh, I think are going to check back a lot on that flop. So he knows that and he expects us to be doing that with these hands. What he doesn't expect us to have is either diamond draw, diamond draw or uh, over pair uh, set two pairs, uh, etc. He doesn't expect us to have these big ends at all. So what we're left with here is air or a medium strength hand that wants to pot control when we check back that flop. So to the turn now. Uh, turn jack of spades and he bets 22 into us. Uh, here we can't really raise and uh, credibly represent anything. We would be either representing like jack 8 or uh, 9 10 if we raise here or pocket jack, but that's not much. Uh, he's gonna put us uh, way too often on the draw, like a space draw if we raise here. And we we, we just certainly don't want to be to be re raised out of our hand because we have a, a well concealed uh, diamond draw here as well as gacha to add to our equity and some nice pot odds, so I think the correct and the standard play is going to be to call the turn. So that's what we end up doing. Pow, oh, call. River is the spades. Ah, not the diamond. So that's a pretty interesting card. What I am going to do is now look at uh, the ends we are representing when we call on the turn. Uh, when we call on the flop, we saw that we are either we we either have air or medium strength hand. Uh, we r ruled out like uh, diamond draw. We ruled out uh, the big ends like over pairs or two pairs or something like that. So we're pretty much left with that. When we call on the turn, we still have these medium strength hands that are possible, but we no longer have tall air. Like we're not calling with tall air on a turn. Uh, what so? We can rule that out. What we are going to have a lot, though, is the backdoor draw. Like air on the flop that turned into backdoor draw, spades, or king 10. That's pretty much the two draws that were air on the flop and that got there on the turn. So now that we kept track of what our opponent thinks exactly we have, in that hand, when we call the turn, that is either a medium strength end or a backdoor draw, we can now uh, look at our possible actions and determine what is our most EV plus play. Obviously, what we want to do is maximize our fold equity here. When I asked uh, Seth, my student here, what he was going, what he was about to do on the river, he told me, uh, I'm going to bet, I think, like 45 or 50. Uh, give me a good price on, a, on my bluff. Uh, try to make him fold a pair of jack, maybe a queen with a bad kicker, or such, and make him fold like all of his medium pocket pairs here. The problem is, he didn't tell me what he was trying to represent. He just told me, I am going to try to make him fold these things. But he was not totally aware of what he was representing. If he would have been aware of that, he would have found out that a much larger bet is a way better way to represent here uh, what we want to be representing, and that is the backdoor space. 
So like I said, by keeping track of what we were representing during the hand, we're left with two things on the river, uh, the medium string end and the backdoor draw. Our opponent certainly does not expect us to bet our medium string hands here on that river. Uh, he, expect, he expects us to check back stuff like uh, pocket 9 or uh, jack 10 or pocket 10 or ace 8 and stuff like that. And that's what we will usually be doing. So when we bet on the river, this actually looks pretty simple when we're looking at it. But uh, from someone who is not keeping track of what he is representing during a hand, it is not going to be as simple as that when he gets to the river. So when we bet the river, uh, we are going to have the backdoor draw like 90% plus of the time. Either spades or a miss king, since there are way more combinations of uh, spades that turn into flush uh, than combinations of king 10, uh, I think our bluff is going to be a, a good one here because it won't get called too often. So now we must ask ourselves how much we would be betting, would we be betting with a, a flush, but more importantly, how much is our opponent uh, expecting us to bet with a flush? And the answer to that is pot or pretty close to the pot. Because that is why a uh, normal, regular, that is how we are thinking normally. Uh, he expects us to be betting our big ends like a flush, pretty big. If we bet like 45, 50 here, uh, our range is still this one. But you don't want to be putting a doubt in the mind of the player. Even though he's trying to hand, run, to hand read you, uh, he's still going to have a doubt in his mind. Uh, when it comes to that river, if let's say he's playing like seven or eight tables and he, he didn't get, he didn't come to the same conclusion as us regarding to a, the strength of our own end, uh, we don't want to be setting him such a good price that he's going to be curious with stuff like king queen or ace queen or stuff like that because he, he's going to think like, yeah, I expect him to have a flush a lot. But I think he's going to bet much bigger with a flush. So, except from the flush, he's not value betting anything here. He has medium strength, and if, if he doesn't have flush, uh, so so I'm going to call and see what he has. If we, if we bet pot or close to the pot, he's going to just look at his cards, look at his in range and he's like okay he doesn't have medium strength and so what we're left with is either spades or the king 10 uh, there are way more combinations of spades than king 10 so I have to fold pretty much everything he has to fold he has, he has to snap fold here he's queen king queen uh, maybe even queen jack we don't expect him to fold like a set because people just never fold sets uh, whatever the action is but since we are very credibly representing a flush here and even more so by betting big on the river uh, we are maximizing our fold equity uh, way more than if we are betting small and if we are not aware that we are trying to represent a flush here. So I, he ended up betting 65, which is like, I think, the minimum here to represent the flush uh, the best way possible. I would have gone with like maybe 70 or 72, but 65 ended up doing the great job and raking in a nice pot. Uh, one note that I want to add here is that if we add like 710 of spades, if we really had the spades here and we really were value betting flush, what we just went through as an, as an analysis, yes, it will lead us to the conclusion that we have to bet much smaller on the river if we want to get called by worse. We came to the conclusion that betting big will make him fold like pretty much anything in his range since we are so credibly representing a flush. So we will have to bet small and that will be the right play. If I had like 7-10 of spades here and I ended up rivering my backdoor flush, I would have gone with a bet of like maybe half pot because I am not expecting him to call uh, anything bigger than that with 
one pair type hand. I expect him to be curious with his one pair type hands. I'm not expecting him to have better than that uh, so often. So I want him to call with like king queen or ace queen or maybe even king jack if he really doesn't believe us. So if, if we really had the spades here, we would have gone with a much smaller bet as a value bet because we discovered that he has to fold pretty much everything to a larger bet. On the other end, like in the example I'm going to show you, if we end up rivering our diamond flush draw here, uh, I just said that if we had the spades flush draw, the spades flush on the river, we would have bet uh, smaller to want to get a call by, get called by pretty much anything in his range. Uh, what I'm going to be looking at here is if we play the the end the exact same way, uh, here that's 22, we call 22, and we end up rivering our flush, our diamond flush, instead of our spades flush, we want, we can get value from much, much more things. We can get a much larger bet as a value because the way the way the end played out than if we ended up having the spades flush. And that is just pretty simple logic. I mean, the, the end played out the exact same way, so the end range is still the same. He expects us to show us with, on that river, either a medium string hand that is going to pot control, or the backdoor draw. He does not expect us to have the diamond draw like at all, because we checked back the flop. So we do have the diamond draw here. So if we bet, we go back to the end ranges he's putting us on, he's going to go wait a minute, he's betting like the pot here, and he can't really have flush draw because he would have bet it on the flop, so he's not betting a medium strength hand neither because he's just going for showdown normally with these ends, so what I'm left with is any backdoor draw that missed and he's probably just trying to make a bad bluff on the diamond and that is going to be his tough process uh, without any further meta game involved. So what we want to do here is instead of value betting like uh, 35 or 40, if we had the spades draw, the, the spades flush on the river, since we have the diamond and he doesn't expect us to show up with that, he expects us to show up with a backdoor flush draw that miss, we can bet like full pot and get a call by pretty much any pair, because he's going to put us on tall air uh, most of the time. So here, I made him call with Jack 10. That's not what happened exactly. But if we revert our flush, that was what would have happened. Uh, yes, that's it. So I hope you are now aware that the exact same hand, uh, depend by the way it has been played out, uh, we can vary our bet sizing on the river depending on what we are trying to represent and what we want to make our opponent think we really have. So that's it for our first end. To the second end. Uh, that end was played by uh, my same student set uh, during the same session at another table. He is facing here an under the gun opener, Jean Palson, who is the uh, same kind of guy then the other end, uh, he looks like a regular. We don't have much of a read, other than he's playing like a couple of tables, uh, playing some tight aggressive style, something around like 25, 20 or something like that. And he is a regular, so he will be looking to put us on end here. He is not just a monkey clicking bu buttons once again. So we, it will mean something to try to represent hands here and that's very important when you're trying to represent hands so we end up calling uh, we could three bet here but i think uh, mixing calling three betting is pretty standard here against an under the gun opener with jacks so we call that time and it is folded around to the big blind who makes the call as well flop comes ace three four big blind checks and our pre-flop razor bets into us. Here it is three-way, but uh, the flop is so dry and an ace-high flop, uh, we expect him to fire his hair 
event tree where like 100% of the time here, if you race with like suited connectors from under the gun or king queen or stuff like that, uh, on that kind of flop, he's going to fire the flop like 100% of the time. So I don't think uh, folding is really an option here. And you have position as well. So uh, the end is going to pretty much play by itself uh, in most cases when you call on that flop. So you call on that flop. And the big blind fold. Turn is a uh, eight of clubs. What I'm going to be looking at, I'm going to do the same exercise as in the other end here. I will be looking at what we are representing uh, now that we are on the turn with our pre-flop call and flop call. Uh, that's the old end. String. String. Eh, that's much better. Anyway, uh, that's our old ends. Uh, new ends. It is going to be, yes, wait a second. Yeah, we are going to take a couple of things into factor here when we build, we will be looking at what we are uh, representing. First, the flop is three away. Is three away. So, we need a much better end, that's for sure, in his mind to call the flop. I mean, he doesn't expect us, I think, to call the flop with any pocket pair, like, by any mean, like, stuff like from uh, pocket 6 to uh, pocket 9 or 10. Uh, I think he expects us to fold that right on the flop because, like I said, the flop is 3 away and he is from under again. He is all aware, he is completely aware of all these, this stuff. So when we call on that flop, on a pretty dry flop, uh, I think... Our end range is pretty strong in his mind. We are, we actually have the, the very bottom of the range we, we are calling with. So we don't expect to get two barrels so often. That's another reason why we call the flop. Uh, we don't, since we are representing a better hand than what we actually have, we don't expect them to get two barrels too often. So, that's it. Any checks that we'll look at what we are representing. Uh, pretty much any ace, uh, especially suited, a six suited or a queen of suit, a six suited, a queen of suit, a jack of suit. Uh, that's pretty much the aces that we are going to call against uh, an under the gun opener here from the cutoff, and he's pretty much aware of that. Uh, a flop set, pocket three or pocket four, three three. 4-4, four, four. or uh, the pocket pairs that are in our gutters, that is 2-2 uh, two, two and 5-5. Five, five. Maybe a small part, a small part of like 5-6 suited or 6-7 suited, but that's not that much in our range because he is from under it again, so we normally call with uh, much better hands. If and we are from the cutoff as well. If we had been from the bottom, uh, our range look at will have looked a little bit uh, weaker. But from the cutoff, uh, we're not calling that often with five students, six seven students, that kind of stuff. So that's only a small part of our range, I think. When we look at that range, uh, it looks pretty strong to me. Like any ace, and he doesn't expect us to fold an ace uh, anywhere soon. The hand, that's why he's not refiring the turn. Uh, a set that's like pocket two and pocket five are like uh, the only two holdings that are pretty weak here. So, like I said, yeah, we look pretty strong. At the same time, we can't really bet that slot because first we have showdown value, a pretty good showdown value with our jacks. They are going to be the best and a lot here, uh, the way the action went, and. Uh, we do not expect him to fold an ace on the turn. So a bluff here would just be stupid. We, we're just making him fold uh, stuff that we already beat. I think that's pretty standard, actually, uh, to check back that turn. And that's what we ended up doing. The river is a pretty interesting card. It is a queen. Here Jean Palson bet 80 into us. I think the most interesting part of that, then, is... Uh, once again, when I asked uh, my student here, said uh, what he was thinking about 
Jean-Paul Sons bet here. And he said, ah, I think he has like Jack, Ace Jack or Ace 10 pretty much always. I can't call here. I'm going to fold. And I was like, all right, your hand reading is super good. That, that, that is great. But you miss the other thing that I talked at the very beginning of the video that is just as important as what you think he has. And that is what he is going to think you have if you make a play on that river. Because you always have to consider making a play on any river. You have to always consider every single one of your options. The funny thing here, actually, is that uh, my student was so hooked up on the value of his hand that he was only trying, he was only looking at calling down. If he had, let's say, a 5-6 suit on that river or any air, let's say if he would never have done that, but if he got to that river with air, he would have thought about bluffing here on that river. But since he got there with a hand that has showed on value, uh, and that's a mistake like every single small stakes and mistakes player do, uh, anytime they have a pair or they have any value, they completely rule out uh, the possibility of bluffing. They completely rule out have ruled that out of their mind, and they end up having a decision between calling and folding. But like I said at the beginning, uh, representing something is way more important than what you actually have. Here, our end is irrelevant because we already concluded that, all right, we can't call. Uh, he has us beat like 100% of, of the time here. He, I don't think he's bluffing that way because our aim range from the flop looked way too strong. And his check on the turn, he knows that this is going to look weak. So he's, he kind of expects us to uh, call him down with like any ace here or maybe even uh, a hand like we have pocket jack because he would think that we would think that his check on the turn would have looked weak. But the reality here is that he has a pair of aces, like pretty much always, and he was trying to put control of the turn because our hand looked so strong on the flop. So yeah, like I said, my student uh, went ahead and told me, all right, he has a jack ace then I can't call here. I told him, wait a minute, like, your read is good, but your conclusion completely sucks because if he has a jack or ace then with that queen on the river, we can bluff him out of his end like every single time. We are going to look at our hand range from the flop. On the flop, we determine that we either add uh, any ace with uh, ace, queen, and any suited ace with ace, queen, and ace, jack of suit being uh, possibilities as well, uh, any set, uh, pocket 2 or pocket 5, and a small part of total bluff. But I think we just completely rule that out because I, we, we can't really rule it out, but just keep in mind that that is really a small, a small part of your range here. So when he bets that river, he obviously wants to get a call from any worse suited, any worse ace than his uh, possible ace jack, ace 10. I think he is betting again uh, ace king on the turn for value against any ace, and possibly ace-queen as well, because we don't really have ace-king in our own range. So from his point of view, ace-king equals ace-queen pretty much. And in my opinion, he is betting them again on the turn, because uh, he wants to get as much value as possible from any ace. So that leaves us with ace-jack, ace-10, maybe ace-9 being uh, the biggest possibilities here. Let's say we do raise on that river. Uh, let's take a look at what we are going to represent with a raise here. If we raise on that river, we can rule out uh, any ace-x that is not two pairs. I think he doesn't, from his point of view, he really doesn't expect us to raise a one ace, one pair of aces here, because we have a uh, show on value and not any value by raising. So we can rule that out. We're not certainly not going to rule out ace-queen. That's like, that will be like our most likely holding. We can rule out uh, ace-jack of suit as well, because we would never raise a river with ace-jack. That's pretty much it. 
we cannot rule out uh, the two sets. They're going to be a pretty small part in his mind. Because he is going to be expecting us to bet the turn a lot with these type of hands. Uh, we do know that if we are playing well, we're not betting the turn 100% here. Let's say we're betting like the turn 75-80% of the time. That still leaves us with a possibility of a set here. That is not a big possibility, but that will be enough to make the... Make the, the balance uh, way toward folding for him. 2-2 uh, two, two and 5-5 five, five is going to be a really, really, really small part in his mind because he doesn't expect us to make him fold a hand like his Jackie Stan, what he's exactly representing here. Uh, he doesn't think that we're going to think about it, especially with a hand that is a pair, actually. Because people just never, at these stakes actually, people just never turn their made ends into bluffs. So we can pretty much rule that out. And we're left with 5-6 and 6-7, which, as we already told, are really small part like preflop, but even more so uh, on the river. Because if we, if we went on the float uh, with these type of hands, I think he expects us to bluff on the turn more often than on the river. So we can rule these out as well. So what we're left here, let's say if we raise that river, is ace queen of suit, which is like, I mean, 80% plus of our range when, I, when we raise here. That's like, he expects us to have ace queen so often when we raise here that he's going to fold pretty much any ace. And 3, 3, and 4, 4. So we're giving ourselves a pretty good price with a raise here on a pretty big pot that if we were if we would have stuck with our our holding we would even not have think about uh bluffing that because uh we have showdown value I can call I'm gonna fold that that's what people usually think. But here since we concentrated all our efforts in reading his ends and reading uh what he thinks we have Instead of what we really have, which is like way more important, once again, I'm repeating myself, but I want to, because I want that to be clear in your minds, that guys, that what he thinks you have is way more important than what you actually have. So, since we concentrated ourselves on what he thinks you have, then we have a pretty easy bluff on the river. The only single end that is going to call us, in my opinion, on the river is... Ace queen, if I mean it's a part of his range, ace queen, and not that big because, like I said, I expect him to be betting the turn, and the queen acts as a blocker as well. He's gonna have ace jack and ace ten uh, far more often because there are less ace queen combinations left in the deck. So I think our raise here is we we are giving ourselves a pretty good price. So we raise a standard amount, an amount that we would raise with uh, if we had it. Ace Queen, uh, an amount that he thinks we're gonna raise if we have Ace Queen, and that is like three times bet here, three times plus twenty dollars, and he ended up folding. That's what actually happened. That that was an actual hand that played out that way, and it ended up working great. And uh, my student was happy that his session was partly repaid by that sexy river bluff because I told I showed him that. Uh, Turning maidens into bluffs is sexy. Don't do it every time, because I just told you that. But when you are going to be concentrated on what you are representing instead of what you really have, uh, you are going to see situations like that arise uh, far more often than you think. So that's it for the second hand. Just, just one more thing that I forgot to mention here. From that end is that a pretty important thing actually is that the board is pretty dry. So we are going to check, be check backing uh, ace queen and sets on the turn a lot. If there was like a flush on the flop, our bluff would be completely stupid because he's going to, he's going to think on the river. Well, uh, I think with flush draw on the flop, he's going to be betting ace queen on the turn and it's all his sets like every time. So I'm going to call with my ace like our 
my East End, but since the board was so dry and the board was completely rainbow in the turn with pretty much no draw at all, uh, it is very credible that we check back the turn with a uh, pocket three or a pocket four or ace queen. So that's still in our range and that's still uh, the biggest part of our range. And we don't have any like missed draws in our range as well, except for our, like small part of two two five five and like five six. So all of that put together makes for a pretty nice river bluff raise spot. Okay, now final end of this video. Uh, it is going to be a bit different first. Uh, it is made up end, uh, but I think. Uh, it it will just serve us perfectly, anyways. And the biggest difference with the other two ends is that we are going to be playing against a retard. Uh, in the first two ends, we looked at first how we can change our bet sizing to like uh, make people believe uh, what we want on what we could have. And on the second end, we looked at how we can turn main ends into a bluff uh, because we are concentrating on what we can represent instead of what we actually have. Here, it's going to be a bit different because, like I said, we're playing against a retard, and the retard is not even trying to put us on specific ends. It is just, it, let's say that his thoughts, his poker thoughts, are pretty limited. So we will be we will be using that to our advantage here. So we find ace a offsuit from the cutoff at the four in the table, so we raise that to 14. And our retard is gonna be the button here, fast and curious. Uh, we just know he's a retard because, uh, well, he has a nickname that is fast and curious. We don't need any much read, I think. So, Flop comes 4-5-7 with a flush draw, so we have uh, two overs, a gutter, and like a backdoor with D8. Uh, that's good enough for me to continuation bet against that type of player, so I do continuation bet. And he calls. Turn is a jack here. That's not the scariest of scare card, but it's still an over card to the board, and betting again here is gonna do a lot of wealth, I think. First, uh, it's kind of value, actually, against any uh, any slush draw that he might have. Any naked six is going to call with that as well. Like, his calling range is pretty wide uh, pre-flop anyways. So, I don't expect him to be folding, like, pair of sevens. He, he's probably going to fold, like, a pair of fours or something like that uh, with no redraw at all, like something like is four on the turn. But I'm not expecting to make him fall like per seven, like I said. But we still have equity. We still have a pretty good draw. And uh, we can get value out of weaker hands, out of draws and stuff like that. So I think that turn is another great spot to bet. Even if the jack is then the scariest of scary cards. So we bet again. And he calls us. Now the river is the ace of spades, uh, yeah, giving us a pair of ace of spades, actually. Never mind. Uh, let's say, let's say it's the ace of diamond, alright. What we want to do before, uh, checking our options here is to look at what we are going to represent on that river. So, let's erase that. Yeah. Uh, now, our most important thing in that end, like I said, uh, Villain is a retard. Let's say he was playing uh, something like, uh, I don't know, 55, uh, like 50 slash uh, 20 preflop. Alright, something like that. That, 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 time, that type of retard. So, what is he gonna put us on if we do happen, if we do happen to bet this river? Actually, I didn't do the exercise before in the end because uh, people like that are so concentrated or in, on their own ends that uh, he, I, I don't think even the, the idea of trying to end read us even crosses his mind. People are just going to do that. These retards are 
actually going to try and end with you, but only once they are on the river and that they can no longer chase their draws or, or stuff like that. Because as long as they have like any sort of draw or any sort of pair that they can improve, they're so sticked to uh, their own hand that like trying to represent anything is kind of useless because he's not even paying attention to what you are doing. So, okay, now we're on the river. The river is a nice. Uh, first thing that I'm going to mention is that against these type of guys, my feeling is that whenever you are the pre-flop raiser, whatever the action is, like no matter what the action is, uh, if an ace comes, it's always like the scariest of scare cards because his reflex is going to put you on any ace. Like, always. So, if we bet pretty big here, uh, we are going to scare him, that's for sure. That's my feel. So, so what, he, what, he, what we know from what he knows from our end, actually, is that we could have an ace. Ace is scary. That's how he thinks. And we bet all street. Bets every street. Regarding these two factors, because they are everything he's taking in consideration right now, uh, he's going to think, I am scared if I don't have more than one pair. That's what he will be thinking, in my opinion, on that river. So now we are going to look at what he on his side could have on that river. Uh, he could have river two pairs, river two pairs sometime with the ace four, five, seven, four, ace five, ace seven. He could have uh, any flush draw actually, any any flush draw, any six, any six. Any seven, any jack, not any jack, like jack that had a redraw or something like that. He's going to have a jack sometimes. Uh, any five, like let's say uh, any medium type, medium pair type. Uh, now is not a good time to get like into a leveling war and go ahead and bet big and tell yourself, oh, He's going to think I'm full of shit because he knows that I'd be bluffing that ace every time I don't have it. And I could have a lot of uh, missed draws in my range and stuff like that. So I'm going to beg big here and OPE roll calls with something like pocket nines. Uh, that would be a good way to think about the end if you were playing against a regular. But here you are playing against a retard. And the retard is not, he's, he's not even trying to hand read you. He's just looking at the ace, and he's like, oh, the ace scares me, and he bets every street, so he must have something. Uh, he's not putting you on exact ends as opposed to what you are doing to him. He's just uh, playing with his feeling. So what we want to do here against that range is we want to extract as much value as possible from any of these ends, the missed slush rod, the missed open, or Miss Gutter and the medium te type pair type hands. Like the medium pair type hand, I, I think on that kind of board is one of the most uh, probable holdings since there are so many medium pair type hands possible. So it's going to be pretty important to get value out of this. And but we we should still keep in mind to get value out of these two. And if he happens to have river two pairs, then too bad you're going to lose money anyways. But he's not going to have that a uh, whole lot compared to the rest. So, given what we have as an information on his end, and what he's going to think we have, if we go ahead and bet big here, uh, we're going to scare him. That That's just what's going to happen. He's not going to go into a leveling war and tell himself, oh, uh, he, he wouldn't bet that big with, like, just the ace. Uh, he can't have that many two pairs. There's a lot of misdraws I call with my medium pair. That's not what will happen. He's going to look at the bet, and he's going to be, oh, $160 is a lot. 
I am going to fall. That's what will happen. What you want to do is just keep him concentrated on his own end and bet an amount that he is going to call with any pair because he will just be curious as to what you have. And even though he'll be suspicious that you have the ace, uh, the amount is going to be so inviting that he will be curious. And the amount is going to be so weird that uh, he's going to bluff raise you a lot with his missed flush draws and with his six because he has air and he now figures out uh, fuck that even though he bet holes every street he's now betting weak on the river so he must have not a big end so I'm going to raise him out of his hand and he's not even going to think about trying to represent something so betting big here accomplishes nothing it would against a regular like I said because a regular might be suspicious if you bet big on that river but against a retard, the only possible play, I, I, I guess, is either a check to try and make him bluff uh, his miss draws. But I think the small bet is even better because you get value from any single possible pair that he has as well as the possible bluff raise that he could make. So we end up here betting 40 with the intention, of course, of snapping if he raises us because he's going to have a miss draw so often. So we raise 40, and he calls with any pair. That time it was pocket three. So we get some nice value that we wouldn't have gotten if uh, we would have got ourselves into like a leveling war, and if we if we would have tried to to get some big value with that ace, uh, which we could have tried against the regular. So that was that last end, guys, was pretty much to show you that uh, representing a hand is really not the same thing against a good player than it is against a real bad player like here in the example so you have to make the difference while you play uh, you have to adjust your play to who you are playing against and how is he going to react to you trying to represent different things so that's pretty much it uh, I hope you guys will now be able to vary your bet sizing according to the board, to the action, to the player, to turn made hands into a bluff when it is time to, and stuff like that, since you will be thinking at what you are representing very clearly, and if you have any question comments, uh, if you want to have sexual intercourse with me, uh, and you are a woman, uh, please contact me. So that's pretty much it. Uh, Dr. Jiggy, aka Martin Fournier-Giger, telling you good night and everything.